homage to the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. Today we're look, going to look at the Dhammapada verse, one of the sayings of the Buddha, and it's in verse number 63. And it's the story of two pickpockets, or two thieves. And this story was when the Buddha was residing at Jethavana Monastery, and on this one occasion, the two pickpockets, along with a group of lay disciples of the Buddha, went to listen to the Buddha uh, give a talk. And on this occasion, the first pickpocket actually listened to the Buddha and gained or attained stream entry. But the second pickpocket, he didn't actually listen to the Buddha and instead he was focused solely on pickpocketing, stealing. And so he managed to steal a small sum of money from one of the lay disciples, which was part of the group. And so after listening to the teachings, after that whole you know, visit to the monastery, they went back to the house of the second thief, the one that had stolen while at the monastery. And the wife of the second thief was quite silly. She actually teased or taunted the first pickpocket by saying to him, look at you, you think you're so wise, but you don't have anything to cook in your house. Which was literally kind of like saying to him, you didn't manage to, to steal anything while you went out today to the monastery, whereas my husband did, so you have to come back to our house and eat something. So after hearing this remark, the first pickpocket thought to himself, uh, the wife of this, this friend of mine is, is quite foolish, but she thinks she's very, very smart. And she also thinks she's being very smart. And so later on, he went back to the monastery with some of his relatives and he recounted this episode to the Buddha. And so the Buddha spoke this verse, Yo balo manyati balayang. Pandito Bapi Tenaso. A fool who considers himself foolish is in this like a sage. Balo cha Pandita Mani Save Balo Tivuchati. But a fool who is proud of his cleverness is truly called fool. So when you listen to the Buddha's words, there's a few things that, that strike you. I think in the first instance, the one that, that strikes is that this woman who was the wife of the second thief, the pickpocket, she's actually quite foolish because what she's doing is endorsing stealing. So by teasing or taunting the first pickpocket, her words are really endorsing the stealing and, and basically derogating the, the friend of her husband who hasn't managed to steal but making fun of him in a very cruel way. So there's a lot of delusion in this woman and out of delusion, she's quite conceited and arrogant. And, and so she's actually quite proud of, of stealing and quite proud of the fact that she's taunting, you know, her husband's friend. And so when the first thief thought after hearing it from, from her directly that she's a fool and that she, she thinks she's quite smart by this foolish kind of speech, which is really wrong speech, then you realize actually he's quite right in that. But the other part to it is the Buddha's words where he says that a fool con who considers himself foolish is, is really like a sage. That's because when you're humble enough to admit wrong, any kind of wrong, whether it's through body, speech or mind, then you're on the, on the track to being like a, a sage because you see it and you're willing to admit it, you're willing to look at it. And that's, that's the first thing to really contemplate in this. And it goes deeper than that. And we'll come back to why it goes deeper than that. But in this first instance, it's really useful to actually be able to be humble, even when we don't know something, like we don't know that we have the wrong view, but be willing to be open to listen, to open, open up to the fact that maybe I'm wrong and to not be foolish, not to be quick to evaluate and come to a very firm standing. And that's in many, many things. And also not to endorse when someone's doing something wrong, to be very careful around it because it's quite akusala, quite unwholesome to do so. The wife in actual fact is party to the husband's stealing when she endorses the stealing 
So there is unwholesome karma that she will have to ripen in the future by actually literally in her own mind condoning the stealing and then feeling proud of, of stealing. So very good kind of story and quite interesting when one can be quite proud of doing wrong things. Now there's many things in our, in our lifetime that we mistakenly, so consciously or unconsciously, can be quite proud of that that is quite unskillful, quite unwholesome. And so it's better to actually look at these things and admit them. And a lot of the meditations that we do, such as when we meditate on defilements from the Anumana Sutta, the Vatupama Sutta, even when we go through cultivating metta and admitting certain things about not being straight and wanting to be straight and upright, and then to be very, very upright, that's also part of this where you admit that you're not quite clean so you're trying to clean it up clean the mind clean speech clean clean up the action and at that point when you admit then it dissolves and so you can move forward with meditations in that sense so this this particular thing from the Buddha is also offering that that one is already like a sage <clears throat> when you actually start to do these things and you know, one doesn't want to be a fool. So let's look a little bit at stealing. Or Adinadana is really also looking at uh, taking what is not given. That's another translation for it. Because someone hasn't given to you, you take it. And, and when you broaden that, you start to see where it can be more than just literal stealing, or pickpocketing, stealing from a bank, all those sorts of things. So... The Kama Nidana Sutta talks about stealing in this sense. It says, Mendicants, I say that stealing is threefold. It's caused by greed, hate, or delusion. So that's quite interesting because the three roots actually underpin taking what is not given or stealing. And then the Adinadana Sutta, which is in the Sangyutta Nikaya, chapter 56, discourse number 72, it says, the sentient beings who refrain from stealing are few, while those who don't refrain are many. And so most of us think that we don't steal, and we think we fall into the few. And we, we, we actually think that most people don't steal, but actually, if you really investigate it, many of us are still stealing. We still take what is not given. And when you look at all the way to right livelihood, this becomes even deeper than that and so we'll look at that we'll come back to that in a minute and so then when you look at the pancha vera bhaya sutta which is sangyutta nikaya chapter 12 discourse number 41 the buddha says anyone who steals creates danger dangers and threats both in the present life and in lives to come and experiences mental pain and sadness that danger and threat is quelled for anyone who refrains from stealing and so that's something also very profound. So when you just take the very literal one of stealing, like a robber, a thief, then the person will literally experience mental pain and sadness in this life. And I think it's because of the grasping nature of it and that it's never enough. Someone who steals, you, you get addicted to that in its own way. And it's never enough, even for the robber who robs a bank, even for the pickpocket, even for the person that steals over the internet. And so you constantly slide, you spend and you probably slide. Even if you were to hoard that wealth, you actually still slide. It's death bound. And so you constantly need to reconstruct. And so when you think about thieves who steal art, who steal money, who steal many, many things, even corruption, then you realize that it can never be quelled. Stealing never begets stealing, as in you can never overcome stealing with stealing. And so that's something quite profound that the Buddha actually talks about quite a lot. The Buddha has this teaching called the Parikamana Sutta in Anguttara Nikaya chapter 10, discourse number 175. And it's all about bypassing unwholesome actions. So the Buddha goes through the different kinds of 10 unwholesome actions, which are by body, speech, and mind. So he starts with saying that by not killing living beings, 
you bypass killing living living beings. And when you uh, don't steal, you bypass stealing. And same with if you avoid sexual misconduct, you bypass sexual misconduct and so on and so forth through speech and through things with the mind. So literally, when you think about the Buddha's teaching, and this occurs even in the Saleka Sutta and other suttas of similar uh, uh, topic, what you find is the Buddha is always saying when you refrain, when you give up the wrong thing uh, and you cultivate the right thing, then what happens is that's how you bypass. And so when it comes to this stealing, like what the pickpockets were doing, by not stealing, you bypass stealing. And so that's the antidote. You never overcome something by doing more of it, is essentially what the Buddha is saying. And we should know that, but sometimes that's not what we do. We actually end up doing more of the wrong thing. So when we think about stealing, taking what is not given, it can actually be very, very broad. So at the base level, it's stealing from a person's purse all the way to stealing from a bank. But then it goes further, it's corruption in the government, it's corruption in a company or fraud in a company, it's cybercrime. And these are the literal things that can be stolen, but there's also things such as ideas when someone steals your ideas at work or claims that they've done the work and then they haven't, so they've taken what has not been given. It's even stealing office supplies, things like that. But Stealing goes further in the Buddha's dispensation because the Buddha talks about stealing that leads to wrong livelihood. And it's a very profound teaching. And when we go deeper into the Noble Eightfold Path, this will be discussed. But the Buddha talks about wrong livelihood being trading in arms, so weaponry. The Buddha talks about uh, selling intoxicants. The Buddha talks about human trafficking. So all these things that are harmful, that is wrong livelihood. So right livelihood in a mundane sense is when you don't have the jobs which are like that. But on the Arya path, the super mundane path, the, the path of the noble ones, one of the reasons the Buddha set up the bhikkhu and the bhikkhuni order is so that one can actually have right livelihood in the super mundane sense, the Arya sense. And so that means you don't hold money, you don't store food and store belongings, you literally, when you ordain, you are given your arms bowl, you're given your robe, and you only are meant to have a roof over your head for the night, and you are given medicines only for a few days. So literally, and then you go arms round, and that is how you get your food. You go at the start of the day, and then that's all you have for, for the day, and you finish eating by, by midday. So that literally is right livelihood. And so when you think about it like that as lay people, if we can admit that we don't have that super mundane kind of right livelihood, that is something that we are sage-like, that we understand that that is where the bar is set for right livelihood. So we can go into that more when we talk about the Noble Eightfold Path a little deeper, but that's something to reflect upon and so in the mundane sense, if we don't have any of those wrong kinds of jobs, wrong kinds of trades, then we still have mundane right livelihood, but at least we can see that we fall short. And the reason for that is really around coming from the right view, the right intention, the right speech, the right action. And I think the key is the right action. That when you still grasp towards wealth to acquire things, to hoard, to store, there is still an element of stealing there. You steal more than what is needed and you increase greed, hatred and delusion. Because stealing, as we saw from one of those suttas, the root of it is greed, hatred and delusion. So when you live the life of a pindapart, monk or nun, bhikkhu or bhikkhuni, who doesn't store food, who only goes for arms round, who doesn't have assets, who doesn't uh, acquire more things, then you are true to living the life of aloba, adosa, moha, non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion. The mind doesn't gravitate towards those things. It only gravitates towards Nibbana. 
So a very profound thing in, in this. But we can come back to it when we look deeper at the Noble Eightfold Path. We can now look at the result of stealing or taking what has not been given. And the Kamapatha Payala is a section within Chapter 3 of the Anguttara Nikaya. And it says, someone with three qualities is cast down to hell. What three? They themselves steal, they encourage others to steal, and they approve of stealing. And then in contrast, it says, someone with three qualities is raised up to heaven. What three? They don't themselves steal, they encourage others to not steal, and they approve of not stealing. So it's very clear that it's more than just what one does or doesn't do. So if you yourself steal, you actually want to refrain from that, because otherwise you could be cast down to hell. But there's two other categories that the Buddha talks about, and this is if you encourage another to steal, or if you endorse or approve stealing, which is a bit like this wife of the pickpocket. So that's also something that you need to refrain from, not to glorify when someone steals or does something that is taking what is not given. I mean, that's why we also reprimand our children not to do those things, is because we don't want them to have that tendency. And in, in that way, we're very good to our children because we're teaching them not to do wrong things. We don't want them to end up in hell as well. And so then the second sutta, which is something that we refer to quite a lot, which is the Ducharita Vipaka Sutta, Anguttara Nikaya, Chapter 8, Discourse Number 40. And the Buddha says, Stealing, when cultivated, developed and practiced, leads to hell, the animal realm or the ghost realm. The minimum result it leads to for a human being is loss of wealth. So that's something that really lines up with when we looked at uh, what's the person's best wealth, that it's important to understand that how we ruin wealth is really when we do things like stealing, when we have corruption, when we endorse the wrong things, we endorse someone stealing, when we glorify it. So these are the things that are very, very important. So when you lament, for example, when we all lament about the governments uh, and how much corruption, when we look at companies and how much fraud, and we look at all these different things that happen that seem very unfair, then the thing to realize is that those people that are actually partaking, joining up, uh, you know, they're, they're part of this wrongdoing, the, the karma for them that they're, they're sowing at the moment and that will ripen in the future, whether it's this lifetime, the next lifetime or beyond, is actually very unwholesome. They can accept, expect either birth in the hell realm, animal realm or ghost realm, or if they're reborn as a human being, they will be uh, quite poor. They will have poverty. And that's the thing that people don't realize who are doing the wrong things right now, who are corrupt, who are fraudulent, who are deceptive, particularly when it comes to stealing, taking what hasn't been given. And that includes public, public property. Then the result is really bad. And so there's nothing that we really need to do. They are the owners of their karma, the heirs to that karma. We don't need to do anything about it. And in actual fact, it's best to refrain from thinking about these people, if possible. And of course, it's quite hard because it's all around us. This world has devolved into so much greed, hatred and delusion. And what you find when you look at all the defilements that people are cultivating when they're, they're in this thing, there's a lot of stinginess. There's a lot of lack of restraint. There's a lot of dusila, you know, bad, bad kinds of actions, you know, not very upright. And of course, there's no shame about doing these things. We can finish our session here with the Ruka Sutta in Sangyutta Nikaya, chapter 45, discourse number 152. And we've referred to this one before. It's where the Buddha is talking about a tree that is slanting and sloping in one particular direction. And he asked the monks that if it was cut, where would it, where would it fall? And of course it falls in the direction that it's inclining towards. And so Buddha likens this to the Noble Eightfold Path. If we cultivate and develop the Noble Eightfold Path, then we will slant and slope towards Nibbana. And so we do this by cultivating right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood 
right effort, right mindfulness and right concentration. And so in this way, that's how we incline towards Nibbana. So really, when we look at this saying of the Buddha that we've been going through today and all the uh, different teachings of the Buddha about stealing and about the result of stealing, it's really an encouragement to investigate, to look inside, to look at the shortfall, but also to understand that when we can admit to areas where we fall short, then we are like a sage. Whereas when we're denying it, discounting it, where we're doing the wrong thing and feeling quite superior around it, then it's really important to understand we're foolish at that point. And so it's really encouragement to to start looking at these things deeper and to really investigate, to really open this up. Because a lot of unhappiness comes from when we are doing the wrong thing, but we don't see it. Or if we don't see it, uh, we see it, but we don't admit it. And there's something really in that when it comes to both wealth in the mundane sense, but also the wealth that the Buddha talks about when it comes to our virtue, our wisdom, our learning, our renunciation in terms of uh, being able to give up. And, you know, many, many things in that in that same kind of, of, of vein. So it's really an encouragement that the more we are able to truly cultivate the Noble Eightfold Path, to refine our practice of the Noble Eightfold Path and really develop it, then we have a much stronger inclination towards Nibbana. And that is will always be very helpful to us. So we can end the session here. Let's share the merit with all sentient beings. May all beings be happy and well. May all beings be free from suffering. Blessings of the Triple Gem. Wishing you all well. Teruan Saranai.